Okay, well, I'm not really sure why I'm doing this, to be honest, uh, but I've decided to uh, sit in front of a camera again, uh, and uh, because I was so nervous at doing it last time, I'm going to get some mates involved. We're, uh, we're hanging out, thank you very much to Google+, Plus. Uh, they're the only ones stupid enough to invite me in front of a camera. Uh, as I said, I've got some friends with me, I've got Josh here, Josh Dunn from China Doll, and thank you for letting us use your joint, Josh. My pleasure, welcome. mate, welcome. Are you nervous? A little bit, yes. No. Jo uh, yesterday, uh, Josh, I came in here to practice with Josh, and uh, he didn't have a voice, so I thought he was going to dodge me like everybody else in the world. I was trying. You were? Yeah, I was giving a nice shot. Thank you very much. Pleasure. All the way uh, across in the Barossa Valley, Ben Chipman, Chippy, as we like to call him. G'day, mate. G'day. How are you? Very, very good. Thank you very much. Now, it's 10.30 in the morning in uh, Adelaide, and uh, obviously you've prepared for this hangout. Uh, by, you know, bringing lots of water? Yeah, I think uh, 150 glasses of water, to be exact, Stewie. <laughs> he's at the, uh, the Barossa Wine Show, and this morning, uh, before 10.30am, uh, he's gone through 50 classes, 50 classes with a C, of wine at the, uh, the Barossa Wine Show, so he's got more glasses going for him than I do, which is a, a, a pretty tough, uh, tough job. In Mornington Peninsula at Main Ridge, 10 minutes by tractor. Um, I've got a blow-in uh, by the name of Dave Anderson. Uh, I'm not really sure why we've got him on, apart from the fact that his head is massive. Morning, Dave. <laughs> thanks, Stu, and thanks for referencing my head. Hopefully the camera can fit it, fit it in. And your head's looking uh, nicely sized with a nice pan back camera. Very Jealous. good, very good. Yes, nice. Thank you very much. I'm lucky. I've got a camera about 15 kilometres away, so my melon doesn't look too big. <laughs> in Tokyo, in Tokyo, another person who's not afraid to drink in the morning, James Rothwell. Good morning, James. Morning, Stewie. Nice to be here. It uh, has the uh, the recent um, uh, uh, drought in razors in Tokyo been uh, you know been fixed, mate, or have you just forgotten to shave? Starting to cool down here now, so it keeps keeps me warm. Yeah, good. Can't grow it on your face, just on your neck. <laughs> not yet. Hopefully, when I get into my thirties. <laughs> very good, very good. That's a yeah, good point. Okay, fine. All right, pick the young bloke with a great job. That's great. Now, Josh, the reason I've got you here, China Doll, uh, the restaurant that we're sitting in, is one of my favourite, um, you know, I guess I'd call it modern Asian uh, restaurants in Sydney, down here on the Finger Wharf at Woolloomooloo. That's the water that you can see behind us. Um, I didn't just set up something that looks beautiful for the sake of this shot. So this is actually where your restaurant is. Yes. Tell me um, the purpose of this week. It's Foodie Week Great. on Google+. And uh, the reason for this hangout is that we're going to try and uh, discuss modern Asian food and wine matching. Tell me some of the principles that you'd employ to uh, match food with a modern Asian dish. Uh, listen, it's, it's not, uh, not dissimilar to typical food and wine matching. It's about finding a balance between fruit and acid. Uh, and, yeah, fruit and acid. Fruit, fruit and acid. Uh, when you've got your, uh, you know, all your dishes, and they're, you've got, they're basically made up of your creamy dishes and you know, traditional French cuisine, uh, you know, your rich dishes, your meaty dishes, you basically want to complement that and also cut through it. Same thing happens with Asian food. Okay. So, so, so are we, are we, so it's complementing? Complementing. And contrasting. And contrasting. Okay. So, uh, the four, in, in Asian food, it's a little bit different. You've got four basic elements. You've got uh, the hot, the sour, the salty, and the sweet. Okay. Um, uh, which is basically makes up all type, all Asian food. Uh, there are four, you know, four key um, key elements. Um, with a, with wine, it gets a little bit tr tricky as far as finding style that will actually match. Um, so, ten, what we tend to look for is a lighter, more aromatic styles. Yes. Uh, in whites, things like your, your rieslings, your pinot gris, your Cabernet Sauvignons. In your reds, your lighter style is much more like Pinot Noirs. Okay. So they want some very good. So James, you're you're in Tokyo, uh, and I'd imagine, uh, well, look, based on your posts, um, all you do is actually eat. Uh, what 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 wine do you find works best for you in Tokyo, with as far as the food is concerned? Do do you agree with Josh's, you know, the the rieslings yeah. and the aromatics? It's tough because I think when food's got bold flavours, you need something to cut through. Um, and I find that Asian food, the first couple of bites are always really enjoyable because it kind of hits you with flavour. So something that keeps refreshing the palate is always good. Um, I actually drink quite a lot of sake with my food here, but um, 
I quite like sparkling wines that completely cleanse my palate. Um, but I think a good Gewurz, a nice Sansa, um, a Burgundy, they all work quite well. Definitely white wine for Japanese people. Uh, a quick question on the sake. Do you drink it hot or cold? Always cold. Always cold. Is that that's the only way to do it? Yeah, you get more as well. You get more. <laughs> well, look, I'm in. I'm, I'm cold from around. Josh, in the restaurant here, yeah. um, you know, James mentioned sparkling wine. It, you know, that sounds to me actually the, just the, the idea of a green apple or something that really does cleanse my palate sounds like a good idea. Do you sell a lot of... Uh... We sell a huge amount of sparkling wine, uh, partly because uh, sitting, we're sitting by the water here. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of place people like to hang out and, uh, and celebrate. But also, yeah, because it does actually really brighten up the palate particularly when you look at a lot of Asian styles, which are, and a lot of Asia is close to the water, so you get a lot of seafood. Right. Uh, and so a lot of those lighter dishes, um, they, they, they lend themselves to a more sparkling, you know, a bright, you know, bright style. Uh, not so much when you're cooking some of your meaty curries, but yeah, certainly all the, the lighter, you know, seafood-based and, and more poultry-based uh, dishes, yeah, certainly go towards a bit of sparkling. Hey, Chippy, uh, I reckon I've sort of uh, set you up a little bit here because uh, Tom Foolery wines, Barossa, Barossa Valley wine, the, the most famous Barossa Valley wines, I guess, are the big Shiraz. I, I, I can't imagine seeing a big Barossa Shiraz on too many tables in an Asian restaurant. Do you, is, that, is, that, is that a bummer or...? That's, that's a pretty fair comment, mate. Um, I think uh, as far as Barossa goes, Shiraz doesn't, doesn't quite work, but looking at um, something like a, a Grenache that's got a little bit of Chinese five spice in the character might work with some of the media dishes. How do you, how do, you do that? So you, you reckon, so in, the, in a Barossa gr Grenache, there's Chinese five spice in there. Is, is there a guy like you just sort of running around the, uh, the, the winery sort of tipping five spices in? Where is it just, where's that coming from? Generally, the soil and, and all Barossa Grenache is not the same. There's you know there's ten different soil types, so you really got to got to be specific on on where you get your Grenache from to to get those sort of characters to come out. So now um, we're drinking. I reckon you might actually know this guy. What we're drinking is we're drinking a 2010 uh, Riesling from Eden Valley, and it's uh, it's Radford. Now Benny Radford, I reckon you've actually worked with him. Yeah, he's a top top bloke, and and he really is. He's leading the way, and he's he's right on top of the Mengler's Hill, which is you know 500 meters uh, above sea level. So you, you're going to make great at Riesling. Uh, I've just got to. Uh, you guys are sitting there. Um, uh, you're sitting there, sort of enjoying uh, one another's company. Uh, but I'm going to actually get some great food while I'm at it. Uh, apologies for that. Dave, um, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to match our food. Um, we're going to match modern Asian food with our wine here. But you're down at ten minutes by tractor, um, and I think yeah, I can see Clayton, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clayton, the restaurant manager from Ten Minutes by Tractor. Clayton, your restaurant actually serves French food. How different do you reckon it is matching wine with French food as opposed to modern Asian? I think it's probably a little bit easier. It's uh, you know there's a lot more sort of spectrum in uh, flavours there. It's, I mean, like our, our chef mixes it up too. He throws in a bit of uh, you know, Asian sort of style. We've got some uh, sashimi tuna on at the moment, so I get to mix it up with a lot, and I'm not sort of pigeonholed into a particular style of cuisine to to match the match the wines there these days. So it makes my job quite uh, easy and exciting. What well, what's the hardest thing uh, for you as a you know a, a, a food and wine matching sort of you know Yoda? <laughs> what's the hardest thing for you to come up with? It's actually it's cheeses. We do a cheese asset at the end of the night, and we do a selection of cheeses. And people often want to choose one cheese to go with. Sorry, one wine to go with. You know, five different cheeses from a you know a triple cream white mold to a, a blue cheese, and then a, a hard cooked. Uh, goat's cheese. Now, I find them the most challenging ones to to match to. And you know, if anybody else can tell me the one wine that matches all those, I'll be very happy with that. Oh, look, I'm sure Dave, uh, perfect person to ask. What one wine matches to all those cheeses, mate? All of them, mate. And any wine that goes in the glass is good enough for me when I ate here. Brilliant. Don't, don't, they could tell me anything and I'd drink it all. So you, you've actually eaten in Clayton's restaurant um, uh, as a food and wine matching, uh, you know, a genius. Uh, do you reckon he does a good mm. job? He actually is is very very good. And my experience here a couple of weeks ago was what brought me back here today. 
to do this Google Hangout session. So the, the only thing that I can say is I wasn't too concerned about what food went with the wine. My experience was that our glasses were nearly empty and, and Clayton might fall over when I tell him this story, <laughs> that our main meal was nearly served and, and, uh, and my wine was empty but the waitress came over. Is that waitress? We like to call, is there a posh name for what we call it? Or no, no, no it's just a waitress. Lily. Yeah. Lily. And, um, and uh, she went, she, she saw the food up on the, on the bench. She saw our wine glasses empty. She came over to us and she said another bottle of the Chardonnay and made it sound very expensive even though we were drinking the cheapest. And, um, and then um, proceeded to turn around, walk past, there's a, we're in the cellar door at the moment, the restaurant's just over behind us. She ran from the restaurant to the bar, ran back again, then served us the wine. And I can tell you that's the best matching, I think, the passion and the speed in which it got delivered. I could have had it with the cheeses, with ice cream, with anything. It tasted beautiful. It, it, look, and I've got to be brutally honest, guys, that, that for me, that sort of, that sort of story, um, when you see a, a, a waiter or a waitress or a restaurant manager with the sort of commitment levels that are the, you know, the six of us have to, uh, to wine, get it, get it in the glass as quick as possible so that we can get it out of the glass. Thanks. When you see a staff member with that sort of commitment level, we're right into it. Now, we need to get some of this food over. We do. So the lovely Michelle, uh, who really should be working on Sale of the Century because she's done so well, get, get it all over here, Michelle. Now, uh, I, I'm a chippy. I'm about to get uh, a, a bunch of different Asian uh, um, entrees here. I I reckon you mentioned, uh, you know, the aromatics and you mentioned maybe um, a gewurz or something like that. The thing that I find difficult about Asian restaurants when you sit down, there's generally five or six, you, you know, it's a, it's a real big sharing environment. How do you cope? Uh, how, how do I order when I've got five or six different things? Back. Coming back. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to. What, what have I got here, Josh? Can you got, tell me what. Tell me what I'm eating here. A little steamed green, a prawn and green bean dumpling. Yep. Uh, a little roast uh, uh, suckling pig and uh, and grapefruit salad. Suckling pig. Suckling pig. Did you say little suckling pig? It's a little suckling pig. So <laughs> should I feel bad because I'm eating a little suckling pig? I mean, as a, as opposed to a mature. I, I depends how how tasty it is, really. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so the suckling pig here. So, I, I said, seriously, what, yeah. I, what do I ask Chippy there? I've got, I've got pig, I've got dumplings, and I've got sashimi. How do I find a wine to all occasions? There's really no absolutes in uh, in food and wine matching. At the end of the day, basically, what you're after is something that tastes good, uh, something you enjoy drinking, um, and something that that can do its best to complement you know, the dishes you've got. Um, as I said, we use a lot of uh, use those aromatic styles because they can't. They're incredibly versatile, uh, and they can go through. You see foods uh, in in Alsace, in Europe, uh, in France. They pair riesling and give us tramina with pork and with you know rich rich food. Uh, these are incredibly versatile styles. So that's what you're after. Something with a lot of fr with fruit flavour. Yep. So it's actually bold enough that's going to hold up against uh, you know, against the flavours that you've got. <coughs> Something with a bit of fruitiness if it's got some uh, some chilli through it because you actually just want to tone that chilli down. Um, and then you know something with good acid, so you, you're refreshing the palate yeah. and brightening it up for the next mouthful. Uh, Chippy, uh, we're, we're drinking this uh, Eden Valley Riesling. Tell me some of the characteristics of an Eden Valley Riesling as opposed to, let's say, a Clare Valley Riesling, another South Australian Riesling. I think the major difference uh, with Eden Valley Riesling is the, the lime and the lemon and the lime that we get. Whereas uh, obviously Clare, you get that more of that flinty, more graphitey character coming through. So. That would be the major difference, but you know, going back to your earlier question, Stewie, I think you should have about 10 bottles of wine on the table for that <laughs> many <minute. laughs> That sounds pretty good to me. Now, Clayton, um, uh, Mornington Peninsula, um, Main Ridge where you are, um, I've tasted a lot of Chardonnay from down there and it, it's amazing. How well do you think Chardonnay um, is placed for a, a, you know, an Asian food table? Oh, look, it's probably not ideal with uh, some of your traditional Chardonnays, but with this day and age, the people that are making Chardonnay are making it a little, a lot leaner. They're trying to sort of uh, work with the wine a lot more to you know, tone down some of those tropical fruit characters that were uh, hated for a while and now bringing in some of them. the pear, the nectarine. You know, they're starting to come in well with some of the Asian styles of cuisine. As long as you get some of those 
uh, ones that are toned down a little bit and sort of uh, have a little bit more acid drive for it, I think they can sort of go in quite well with the Asian cuisine. Tell me one of the things, what is, who's making a coffee? <laughs> we got coffee, goes, coffee goes with Asian cuisine as well, I think. Um, let's see what? Uh, so, uh, 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 I might ask Josh this actually. Josh, um, would you, uh, with a, an Asian meal, yeah. would you have an espresso or would you have a macchiato? Are we, are we frothing the milk? No, definitely an espresso. An espresso? Definitely espresso. You can't have milk with Asian food. Well, which, which, which coffee bean are we having? Oh, the Arabica. The Arabica, right. Oh, there we go. We've got there Arabica go. coffee, espresso. You've heard it Perfect. first, right here. <laughs> Google Plus Hangout with Josh from China Doll. Espressos, Asian food, forget the wine. That's what you're doing. There we go. Full stop. Now, uh, uh, James, um, what I want to know from you, mate, um, I'm going to introduce today this uh, slightly, it's a slight variation on food and wine matching. Uh, I'm going to call it Stuart McGill's Test Match. Um, now, the, the concept is, and the good thing about this for you, James, because you're wrong quite a lot. Uh, um, <laughs> you're wrong about your looks. You're wrong about the shaving thing. That's very wrong. Um, but what you can be right about is you can be right in Stuart McGill's test match. It's matching a wine to a particular challenge that I provide you with. In this case, for example, I'm going to match, I want you to match uh, Tokyo with a wine to give you an idea. I'm going to let you think about it uh, for a minute while I'm describing it to you. Give you an idea. I spoke to uh, some of the lovely people at Google Plus a little bit earlier on and I asked them to match a wine with Google. Now, uh, you might think that this is uh, quite a difficult uh, task. It's not at all. And in fact, I've got a great story. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So Ben and Kendall uh, uh, got married uh, recently. It's a very, very, it's a match made in heaven, apparently. Um, well, so far it is, Ben. I've got some bad news for you. Um, <coughs> challenges ahead, that's all I'm saying. Uh, but no, Ben and Kendall got married at a beautiful winery uh, called Lewin Estate. Now, I asked him to match a wine with Google. Google uh, was uh, founded in 2005, apparently. Now, it, and by the way, if I'm wrong, and any of you want to tell me about it, I got this from the Google Plus people, okay? But you're so you're definitely wrong about that one. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> See? So, everybody here, you're fine. James, thank you very much. What year is Google founded? Well, now you've put me on the spot. I want to say... Oh, here we go. <laughs> I want to say 97. There we go. Okay, so what we're doing is 2005 was actually the year that Ben and uh, Kendall got married. So um, I was trying to palm off some of the blame there, and, and that wasn't it at all. Um, Google, uh, Google apparently, Josh, matches mm. perfectly with an 05 Lewin Estate Cabernet. Uh, and I've got to say... From personal experience, anything matches with a low and estate cabinet. But that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So, James, over to you. A wine that matches perfectly with Tokyo. It's a tough one. It's got to be something bubbly. Um, Tokyo is, I would say, one of the strangest cities in the world. So, um, I'm going to, I think a Perio Jue Bella Park. I think it's expensive, vibrant. Not mainstream, bit different, but very, very good, very interesting. I think I think that's a good match. So, so um, these are the uh, it's a champagne bottle that's hand painted, right? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Ornate, so, beautiful. See, so this is exactly the sort of thing that I want to do. So we've got Tokyo, and the way you can describe Tokyo is bubbly, expensive, creative, and a little bit different. Yeah. Okay, so right, Jay, Jay, I've got to say that's the first time, apart from Ben and Campbell, which I must say is uh, you know a perfect on train to the Stuart McGill's Test match. Um, James Rothwell, I'm very very impressed with you, and you've set the bar very very high. So when you do that, what you do is you always throw to somebody else and try and floor them immediately. Chippy, it's over to you. I want you to match a wine with the Barossa Valley Wine Show. <laughs> what did you? What was that? <laughs> Oh, Your sound. Can you see that? Yeah, I see that. That's the program from this morning. But uh, the wine that I would match to the, the Barossa Valley Wine Show would be uh, the Henschke's Johans Garden, which is Grenache Shiraz Mataro. And I'd match that because we are a little family here in the Barossa Valley. Henschke's are family owned. And we, we try to bring a lot of different things to the table, which is what Grenache Shiraz and Mataro do in a wine. So. Okay. So you, you bring lots of things to the table. So, because I'm going to write all these down and I'm going to post them later on, by the way. So <laughs> you, you know that forever this will live on. Yeah. 
The Barossa Rally Wine Show next year will probably, people will just go there and only want it. You've, you've done yourself out of some business. Tom Fullery <laughs> Wines, Tom Fullery Wines will, will probably struggle and people will be going straight for the Johans. Well, mate, you, you've got to pay, you got to dip your hat at some point in time, don't you? <laughs> exactly. And I'll dip my hat to you, my friend. Now, uh, Clayton, we've got some good news for you. Um, we've got some duck over here. The lovely Michelle uh, will uh, once together d deliver with a flourish. Um, morning Thank to you. Peninsula and Pinot Noir, synonymous. Cheers. I've heard that duck and Pinot work together. Expand. I, look, I, I, I would have to concur. I would have to concur with that. And then you've got a little tiny spice of duck there. A nice elegant pinot with a, you know, a little bit of tannin, sort of a decent amount of acidity and some nice spice with some red fruit, I think would uh, just blend in beautifully with the, the spices that you get from duck breast. Can I, can I, I, jump, I want to jump on the red fruit thing. One thing that I uh, always notice with food and wine matching is, you know, people say stone fruits, people say, the thing I love about red fruits as opposed to black fruits this is actually Michelle banging on pans here, by the way, uh, just to prove that we're in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, uh, red fruits and black fruits, to me, is a really good um, way of getting into, you know, food and wine matching. What you mean by red fruits is that they're they're a little bit sort of more tart, or uh, you know, um, uh, the acid levels are higher. Is that is that what you mean? Uh, a little bit lighter, a little bit fresher, you know, they don't have the, the same intensity that you get from some of the, the black fruits. So it's a little bit more, a little bit more elegant, a little bit more feminine, I suppose. It's more feminine? The, yeah. Dave, Dave, I've got a problem here. Dave, you and I have been drinking way too much Pinot lately, I, I'd suggest. <laughs> um, uh, do, you, do you like the, the Pinots from Mornington, Dave? I mean, you're sitting next to uh, uh, Mr. Ten Minutes by Tractor, so be very careful. Mate, I absolutely love them. Um, the only problem with Pinot is I, on my salary, I don't think I can afford most of them. So I probably spend too much time at these cellar doors drinking everything with the reserve in front of it, which I get to do today. What are you drinking? Tell me what you're drinking now, Dave, and, and I want you to describe it for me. Okay, well, I'm drinking the 2010 Estate Pinot um, from 10 Minutes by Tractor. And uh, I was just drinking the Chardonnay, so I can tell you... It's very, um, and I've never, I grew up in Perth, as you know, so I've been into Cab Sabs and all those sort of peppery things. So when I first started drinking Pinot, I thought it smelled a little bit like dirty socks until I came to the Mornington Peninsula and I can really taste the fruit um, and the berries in, in these particular wines. And then I suppose in the cheaper ones, you, you get more of the plum and things like that. And I'm hopeless at explaining. I mean, I'm, I can try and pull the wool over your guys' eyes, but really... Um, I drink any of this stuff and I, and I love it, but but the, the the better the Pinot, I suppose, it just gets a little bit more complex for me. Yeah. Um, and, and I can, you know, I've drunk some stonier stuff that, that I can taste the vines and and the earthy characteristics of the Pinot. So, um, you know, this particular wine is beautiful at eleven twenty three in the morning. <laughs> but for somebody who uh, reckons he's no good at describing wines, Dave, I think you did a pretty good job there. Yeah. Josh, Nothing what we're drinking. We're drinking a stony rice pinot from yeah. Tasmania. Tell me a little bit about uh, that. Actually made by a, uh, a bloke called Joe Hollyman, who, uh, who I, know, know, I know a little, I know a little bit about who Joe Hollyman. He used to be uh, wicketkeeper for uh, Tasmania. Joe right? Hollyman. So this is the, uh, the we're drinking here. You probably struggle. We're drinking the stony rice pinot uh, uh, from uh, uh, Tasmania. Joe Hollyman, who makes it, um, used to be a wicketkeeper. I played uh, state cricket for Tasmania, and he was horrified when I actually recognised him, because uh, he's actually, he's a really, really great winemaker. This, is his, this is his entry level This pinot. is entry level Pinot, it's, uh, his, his top level is called Hollyman Wines, but uh, this is a little entry level uh, from, you know, from some of his younger vines in Tassie, and it's just delicious. It's basically bright, it's got good acidity, and it's a kind of Pinot that you actually just want a second class of. The, 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 the really funny thing is, Josh, most Pinot, most cheap, you know, cheap, Entry level Pinots in Australia, yeah. they smell too much of the bright berries and heaps of fruit. Yeah. They're little fruit bombs, and it's just a light red. This one smells like something that I would, you know, pay a lot of money so for. It's a, bit, it's a bit more serious. It's got some structure to it. It's got that uh, got some tannin, which sort of makes it a bit moreish. Uh, hence, you, you you want actually to be dining with it. You, you know, it gets those salivary glands going. You want a mouthful of food. You want a second glass of wine. Um, it's got some enough of the complexity there that actually it keeps you interested. 
Well, so. look, uh, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's probably time. We've got the duck on the table here. It's probably time that I actually get into it. But I've got two more questions, okay? The first question is for Chippy. Chippy, Barossa Valley, have you ever tried to make a Pinot? I have to admit, I made one in 2011, Stewie, so yes. And up, up, up from Stein, Steingarten, which is quite quite high, 400 metres above sea level, so I had a go at it. And, and so 400 metres above sea level, even though I associate the Barossa with a big Shiraz, 400 metres above sea level, you, you're a chance to put something quite handy together, aren't you? Well, obviously uh, Steingarten um, is synonymous with Riesling, so uh, it, it's cold enough for, in a cold year to do Pinot, but uh, I'll say that with a smile on my face. <laughs> very good. I'm looking forward to tasting it. Uh, Dave, this is the final question. It's very important when you're doing a Google Plus hang to finish off very, very strongly. Oh, I, thought, I thought about closing it myself, um, mm. but instead uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to close this hangout with a Stuart McGill test match, and the test match David Anderson, should you choose to accept this mission, what you don't know, guys, is that David Anderson is an incredibly talented musician. Incredibly talented. Uh, if, if, if you look him up uh, uh, on uh, iTunes, you could probably even get a hold of his stuff if they still allow it to be sold. There's a parental advisory on David Anderson's music, and it's not strong language. It's questionable talent. But uh, what I want you to do, Dave, I want you to come... That was a joke. I love his music. What I want you, and by the way, I was with Jamie Dwyer yesterday, Dave, and he said that he thinks that you are one of the best musicians he's ever seen. So there we go. There's a little free. He's play seen me? Yeah, seriously, he's actually seen you play. Um, okay. I want you, David Anderson, to match a wine. I want you to match a wine with your guitar. Okay. No pressure. Uh, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, no, no pressure. Man. Yeah, thanks. And finish strongly. But, uh, yeah. okay, uh, with my guitar, well, my guitar is black, so that gives it a start. It's not a pale, blondy, Chardonnay-looking coloured guitar. It's a, it's a black one, so I'm going to have to go red. Um, it's, you know, I, I would go, it, it has to be a heavier red, I think, because it's pretty rich, and some of the things that I do, I think, are, I like to think anyway. I like to think I'm I'm pretty soulful and and moody and earthy and and then I guess when I throw all those things together then I guess it's got to be a blend because you've got to throw everything in because just that my own talent alone isn't going to be enough to sell more than ten CDs to pay for the damn thing and therefore <laughs> it probably has to be cheap as well because you know, um, I can't really afford anything else and although my guitar is 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 it's a good guitar but you know, it's probably not that well known. So I'm kind of a little bit lost now, but I think I'm a Cab Merlot. Maybe I'm a Cab Shiraz Merlot. I'm a big blend, but I'm pretty obscure and no one's really heard of me. So um, am I, I could be something from France. No one in Australia right. would probably know that. So like yeah. I'm big over there apparently. So yeah, I'm going to go like a Bordeaux something. Yeah, look, yeah. And, and, as I said, Dave. Languedoc? Languedoc. Yeah. It's just Languedoc. There, there you are. I'm a Languedoc. That's Clayton. my guitar. My guitar is a Languedoc. <laughs> Clay, Clayton, uh, Clayton from uh, 10 Minutes by Tractor, thank you very, very much for joining us. David Anderson, thank you very, very much for joining us. I think you're actually probably more a Bulgarian wine, uh, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's so nice. Look, and, and there was that there was that episode of The Simpsons that I saw where Bart was making wine with uh, oh, know, Andy Freeze. Yeah, Andy yeah, Freeze. That you could also be that one. So maybe I'm if a that's in language. Of Pino, then. I'm a then. I'm a Brosapino. Okay. Then. <laughs> Obscure. <laughs> Listen, none of us have tasted none of us have tasted Chippy's Pinot yet from Steingarten. I'm sure it's going to be very, very good. We're going to wait till that comes out. Chippy, I hope you put it under the Tom Foolery label because that's just about a guarantee it'll be good. Everything else you guys do, I love it. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. No problem. And uh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ben Chipman from Tom Foolery is a very, very recent convert. To Google Plus, so he's made a very special effort this morning. Thank you, mate. Thank you, James Rothwell in Tokyo. Um, once again, I don't know what you do apart from eat and drink, so thank you very much. You're welcome. That is all I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, most importantly, uh, the people uh, today who looked after me particularly very well, 
um, uh, Josh uh, from China Doll down here on the Finger Wharf in Willamaloo. Thank you Thanks, very, man. very much. I, I, I really appreciate you helping me out. No, pleasure, mate. Good to have you here. Great. Now, uh, because we've been sitting here, what I'm going to do in January, you've heard of Occupy Wall Street. What I'm going to do in January, I know it seems a long way off, but we've got to plan these events a little bit more than I planned today. We're going to do Occupy China Doll. Uh, we're going to occupy China Doll sometime in January, so stay tuned. You can see that one. That's January 2012 for all the people in 2015 that jump on top of me. Sorry, 2013 actually. <laughs> January 2013 is when we're going to occupy uh, China Doll. Uh, so if you're coming to this video via YouTube in 2020, you're a little bit late, I'm sorry, but I'm sure they're still taking reservations. Thank you very much to everyone. Guys, uh, I was very nervous, and now I'm going to drink all of these glasses. Thank you. Cheers, Enjoy guys. your duck. Adios. Cheers. Bye. See you guys. Cheers. See you, man. Bye.